Content warning. This episode contains discussion of murder and violence. I got hooked on the JFK assassination case a long time ago. And when I say hooked, I really mean it. I bought and read literally hundreds of books on this case, and I was totally convinced there was an extensive conspiracy behind what happened. I don't believe that anymore. Before we get into the facts that changed my mind, I'd like to make what might seem to be an obvious point. You don't change people's minds by insulting them. When I believed there was a conspiracy in the case, nothing annoyed me more than hearing people say I was crazy or that I believed in a conspiracy because I had some sort of childish emotional need to believe a president could not be murdered by one lone gunman. Those sorts of comments never made me question or reassess my views. If anything, they made me hunker down and get defensive and become more and more convinced I was right. But, of course, I was not right. The reason I came to the wrong conclusions, though, had nothing to do with me being mentally unwell or having some bizarre emotional need to believe JFK had been killed by a massive conspiracy. I was wrong because I made the mistake of trusting sources who were deliberately lying to their audience. With all of this in mind, I want to stress first that In these episodes, we are not going to make fun of anyone who has come to a different conclusion than we have about this case. Let's just assume that we're all trying to sort out the truth in good faith. And I also want to encourage you all not to make the same mistake I did. If you want to figure out what you think about a controversial issue, make an effort to find out the best arguments on both sides of the fight. Too many people, intentionally or not, will try to present or manipulate facts in a way as to get you to agree with them. This is why in court, both the defense and the prosecution get a chance to talk to the jury. You need to hear both sides out before you come to any conclusion. And that goes for this case too. And if you want to hear the case for a conspiracy in the JFK assassination, well, God knows there are plenty of things for you to choose from. But the murder sheet is going to focus on the other side. We are going to explain why we believe a lone gunman is responsible for the murder of President John Kennedy. My name is Anya Kane. I'm a journalist. And I'm Kevin Greenlee. I'm an attorney. We first connected while looking into the Burger Chef murders, an Indiana cold case. Together, We built a spreadsheet documenting hundreds of cases of restaurant-related homicides. That original spreadsheet gave way to our podcast, The Murder Sheet. Now we maintain that same research-centric, investigative approach as we look into all sorts of homicides, including unsolved cases, historical crimes, and, of course, restaurant murders. We don't just chat about the headlines. Our podcast is a platform for our journalism. The Murder Sheet focuses on investigative reporting, thoughtful analysis, thorough research, and in-depth interviews. We're the Murder Sheet. And this is the JFK Assassination Part 1. The JFK case is actually one of those rare cases where the more you learn about it, the less you actually understand. Let me give you a simple one-line summary. On November 22, 1963, in the city of Dallas, Texas, Lee Harvey Oswald, acting alone, fired three shots which killed President John F. Kennedy, 
and wounded Texas Governor John Connolly. Once we get too far beyond that, things start getting bewildering pretty quickly. One reason for this is that the discussion of the case is dominated by non-falsifiable statements. What does that mean? Well, basically, a falsifiable statement is exactly what it sounds like. It's a statement that can be proven false. And from a scientific viewpoint, a statement cannot be considered true unless it is falsifiable. I know that sounds confusing. It's like I'm saying a statement can't be true unless you can prove it's false. So let me try to make it a bit clearer with an example or two. Here is a falsifiable statement. The mailbox in front of our house is red. That is a true statement, but it is falsifiable because you can easily imagine what evidence it would take to prove it false. Someone could take a picture over the front of our house and it could show a blue mailbox. That would prove the statement false. You could talk to reliable eyewitnesses who walked by the house, and if they told you the mailbox was not red, then that would also prove the statement false. Does that make sense? Being able to imagine evidence that would prove something untrue means it's falsifiable. And that in turn makes it part of a shared objective reality we can all agree on. But as we've said, discussion of this case is dominated by non-falsifiable statements. Let's give you an example. Sometimes when people talk about the assassination, they will bring up the absolute overwhelming evidence against Oswald, and someone will reply saying something to the effect that the fact that there is so much stuff establishing Oswald as the lone assassin actually just proves how powerful the conspiracy was. In other words, the conspirators were so powerful that they were able to fake evidence showing that Oswald was guilty. That's a non-falsifiable statement. There is no way to disprove it. No matter what evidence anyone comes up with pointing to Oswald's guilt, someone can just claim it was all faked. And that leads us to confusion. So we are not going to deal with those sorts of statements here. If there is actual proof that any evidence is fake or weak, we will discuss it. Otherwise, we will operate on the belief that the evidence is real and we will follow it where it leads. And there is something else we should note. There is an extraordinary amount of detail known about every element of this case. There have been multiple government and independent investigations in which thousands and thousands of people have been interviewed at great length. My favorite book about the case, Vincent Bugliosi's Reclaiming History, runs an incredible 1,648 pages, and it also contains a CD with over a 1,000 pages of additional notes. The sheer amount of information about the assassination is daunting. We are not going to try your patience by delving into every last bit of it. We are going to focus on the details that we think are most important. With that said, we are going to be honest, and we are not going to hide information that secretly contradicts our conclusions. We are just not going to go into all the intricate details of each and everything that happened. But we will discuss some sources you can turn to if you are interested in learning those details. We are going to do this in at least two parts. In the first, we are going to lay out the evidence that Lee Harvey Oswald killed President Kennedy and Patrolman J.D. Tibbet on November 22, 1963. In the second part, we will try to answer some questions we received from listeners about this subject. As you probably know, Kennedy was shot to death as he rode in a car that was passing through Dealey Plaza in Dallas, Texas. There were several buildings in the area from which a sniper could have conceivably fired the fatal shots. So, how do we know where the gunman was? Well, Passengers in the presidential motorcade reported that they thought the sound of the shots came from behind and to the right of them, which would have indicated they came from a building called the Texas School Book Depository. We want to be honest and fair, so we were note that some witnesses on site thought the gunshots came from different areas around the plaza, but no further evidence other than their impressions ever supported their claims. 
Let's talk about some witnesses who were closer to the scene than almost anyone. There was a group of people watching the presidential motorcade from the fifth floor of the school book depository. They told authorities that they heard the shots as well, and that it was so loud it was clear the gun was being fired directly above them, which would have placed the gunman on the sixth floor of the building. But this is still just ear witness testimony. Did anyone actually see anything that places the shooter on the sixth floor of the depository? The answer is yes. First, there's Robert Jackson. He was a well-respected news photographer for the Dallas Times Herald. He was in the presidential motorcade that day, covering it for his paper. He was several cars behind the president. When the shooting started, Jackson looked in the direction of the school book depository which is where he thought it sounded like the shots were coming from. He saw what looked like the barrel of a rifle sticking out of the sixth floor window, and as he watched, he observed it slowly being pulled back inside. Jackson yelled to the other reporters in the car. One of them, Malcolm Couch, a newsreel cameraman, was also quick enough to see the rifle being pulled back into the building. And there's more. Deary Cabell, the wife of the mayor of Dallas, was also in the motorcade, and she reported seeing a long-looking object sticking out of the sixth-floor window during the shooting. Fifteen-year-old Amos Younes was down on the street, facing the school book depository. He also reported seeing a pipe-like thing sticking out of the window. There's one other witness. Howard Brennan was at a retaining wall about 107 feet away from the Texas School Book Depository. We know exactly where he was because he actually appears in the film that Abraham Zapruder took of the assassination. Before the motorcade arrived, Brennan noticed a man occasionally appearing at the sixth floor window. When the president's car drove by and the shooting started, Brennan happened to look up and he says he saw the same man fire the fatal shot. Jumping ahead, when doctors examined the bullet wounds to President Kennedy and Texas Governor John Connolly, they found that all the injuries were consistent with having come from a weapon that was elevated and to the rear of the victims. So, from all those accounts, it seems clear that the gunman was operating from the sixth floor of the school book depository. Let's follow the investigators up to the sixth floor of the building and see what they found there. Around the sixth floor window, they discovered a pile of carefully arranged cartons, as if someone was using them to obscure himself from the view of anyone who might happen to come by. By the window, they also found three spent cartridge cases. Near the staircase, between two rows of boxes, they found a man liquor carcano which was a bolt-action rifle. The cartridges were consistent with having come from that weapon, and the recovered bullets from the shooting were also consistent with that weapon. So, how do we figure out who that weapon belonged to? Law enforcement traced it using the serial number. A company named Crescent Firearms had shipped it to a business named Klein's Sporting Goods, which operated out of Chicago, The employees at Klein's went through all of their records and found that they had in turn shipped it to a man using the name A. Hedell, who gave his address as a post office box in Dallas, Texas. That post office box was rented at that time to Lee Oswald. The handwriting on the order to Klein's and the money order used to pay for it was also identified as the handwriting of Lee Oswald. This all conclusively ties the murder weapon to Lee Harvey Oswald, who happened to be an employee of the Texas School Book Depository. But there is more. Oswald was so proud of his new weapon that he had his wife Marina take pictures of him brandishing it. These pictures of Oswald actually holding the murder weapon connect him to it even further. But it does not quite place the weapon in his hands at the time of the murder. Before we pull back and consider that question, let's pause for a moment to listen to a few messages from some of our wonderful sponsors. We always love to cover a good historical mystery on the murder sheet, 
So it's not a huge shock that our favorite game is all about a 1920s detective, hot on the trail of all sorts of strange happenings. We're talking about June's Journey. It's a free-to-download hidden object game, and it's utterly delightful. You play as June Parker, a sleuth from the 1920s. In each level, you inspect scenes for hidden clues. I play so much that I'm already on chapter 12. To advance levels, you get to decorate your own personal island estate. I love collecting different features, like a beautiful swan pond, a swirling windmill, and a gaggle of old-time reporters. I'm very proud of all of those. Whenever I'm solving mysteries, I get to travel everywhere from Cuba to Paris to Italy to investigate cases involving artistic scandals, blackmail, and murder most foul. One thing that makes June's journey special for me is the lovely artwork underpinning each level. The attention to detail really makes each scene come alive. And the characters are packed with personality. It's really immersive and makes us feel like we've been dropped into an old-fashioned mystery story. I can get a bit antsy whenever I'm stuck waiting in line or on hold during a call. June's Journey is a great respite, a chance to play a fun game and get a mental boost while I'm at it. Find your first clue by downloading June's Journey today. Available on Android and iOS mobile devices, as well as on PC through Facebook games. So, how can we establish that Oswald actually brought that weapon to work on the morning of the assassination? Well, in the fall of 1963, Oswald did not have an especially happy domestic situation. He was married and had two kids. But he did not have much money, and he and his wife Marina frequently fought. It got to the point where he could not afford to pay for a place nice enough for his family. A woman named Ruth Payne stepped in. She had a nice house out in the Dallas suburbs and was herself separated from her husband. She had plenty of room for the Oswalds. She allowed Marina and her kids to move in. She even let the family store their things in the garage. Meanwhile, Oswald himself rented a room at a boarding house in the city. Ruth helped Oswald get his job at the Texas School Book Depository, and she also let him come and stay at the house with his family every weekend. As fate would have it, Wesley Frazier, another worker at the depository, lived nearby Ruth's house. So, on Fridays after work, he would drive Oswald to the suburban Payne house. And then, on Monday mornings, he would drive Oswald back to the depository. The rest of the week, it is important to note, Oswald would stay alone in his room in Dallas. Now, I think everyone who follows true crime knows... When someone changes or breaks a familiar routine, it often means something. Well, on the week of the assassination, Oswald changed his routine. The president was coming to town on Friday. On Thursday, Oswald approached Frazier at work. He asked the man to give him a ride out to the Payne house that evening instead of Friday. Frazier agreed. Oswald did not give his wife or Ruth Payne any advance word that he was coming out a day early, and they were surprised to see him. In the early part of his visit, Oswald all but begged Marina to resume more of a normal living relationship with him. He told her with his job, he could now afford a place big enough for her and their kids. They could live together and be a family again. Marina turned him down. Around 9 p.m. that night, Ruth Payne went out to her garage. She noticed that the light was on, and she was certain that she had not left it on. The likely explanation is that at some earlier point that evening, Oswald spent some time out in the garage. This is important because the garage is where his possessions, including his rifle, were kept. The next morning, when Frazier picked him up for work, Oswald had a long, narrow package with him, a package wrapped in brown paper. Oswald told Frazier that this package contained curtain rods, but it seems clear that it actually contained the murder rifle, and that Oswald had made a special early trip to the Payne residence in order to have it on hand when Kennedy drove by, and that Oswald had basically tricked Frazier into helping him get the rifle to what would become the scene of the crime. Now, let's stop here for just a moment. 
There are, as we all know, many, many conspiracy theories about the JFK assassination. Most of these theories seem to be highly complex and require extremely powerful people and organizations to meticulously plan every detail about what happened on the day of the assassination. If there was a conspiracy, can we really believe that something as crucial as the gunman getting the murder weapon from his home to the crime scene was allowed to wait until the very last minute? And that this plan required the gunman to rely on getting a ride from a work buddy. And let's just talk a bit more about that rifle. After it was found, police discovered a palm print on the weapon that belonged to Oswald. And there's more. Several fibers from a shirt were found stuck on the rifle. These fibers match the shirt Oswald is known to have worn on the day of the assassination. We believe all these facts clearly establish that the JFK murder weapon found in the school book depository belonged to Lee Harvey Oswald, that Oswald made a special trip to retrieve it from the Payne garage, and that he took it to work where he used it to murder the president. Let's take a look now at what Oswald did after the assassination. We think it's important to look in particular at things that might show a consciousness of guilt. We say this because we believe most people who follow true crime realize that very often a guilty person will act differently from an innocent person. So, with that in mind, what did Oswald do after the shooting? Well, the first thing he did was get out of there. Literally every other employee of the Texas School Book Depository remained in the area. But Oswald left. Why? We believe it is because he was a guilty man fleeing the scene of his crime. He made his way to his room at the boarding house. He rushed inside, grabbed his pistol, and then rushed back out again. He began walking briskly down the street and before long encountered Dallas police officer J.D. Tibbet. Tibbet was alone in his patrol car and pulled up near Oswald. The two men had some sort of exchange. We can't say for certain what they said or even why Oswald attracted Tibbet's attention. But we do know that Tibbet must have not been terribly satisfied with whatever Oswald told him because the officer got out of the car. At that point, Oswald pulled out his pistol and fired repeatedly at Tibbet killing him. Oswald then fled the scene. Now we know Oswald was the one who murdered Tippett for a few reasons. The first is that several eyewitnesses saw what happened and identified Oswald as the shooter. And the second is that when Oswald was arrested a short time later, he was still carrying the Tippett murder weapon. We believe Oswald retrieving his pistol and then killing Tibbet is another way the assassin showed consciousness of guilt. This was a man who knew his whole world would collapse if he was apprehended by law enforcement, so he was willing to kill to remain free. It is obviously difficult to understand why an innocent man would react to the appearance of a police officer by pulling out a gun and killing the officer. Now, even in the wake of a presidential assassination, the murder of a police officer attracts quite a bit of attention, and a flurry of police cars descended on the area where Tippett was killed. Oswald, probably just looking for a place to hide for a few hours, slipped into a movie theater. But a shoe salesman named Johnny Brewer spotted him and notified police. They had the projectionist stop the movie and turn up the house lights, and then they went in. A patrolman named M.N. McDonald was the first one to reach Oswald. He asked Oswald to stand up, and the assassin did so. But cooperation was not his plan. Well, said Oswald, it's all over now. He hit McDonald in the face with his left hand, and with his right hand, he pulled out his gun. And again, this was the gun that had just been used to kill J.D. Tippett. McDonald and Oswald scuffled, with other officers joining in. Thankfully, the police were able to keep Oswald from discharging his weapon, and they took him into custody. 
Now, needless to say, a man who pulls a gun on a police officer who merely asks him to stand up is clearly showing consciousness of guilt. You would simply not expect a rational, innocent person to behave in that fashion. Hopefully, this episode has done a good job explaining why investigators were able to conclude that Oswald, acting alone, was the person who shot President Kennedy and J.D. Tibbet to death on November 22, 1963. And in case it is not clear, the two of us definitely share that conclusion. We've taken this story up to the point where Oswald was placed into custody. Though it goes a bit beyond the purview of what we planned, it feels like we should take at least a few quick minutes to tell how Oswald's detention ended. He was arrested on Friday, November 22nd, 1963, and taken to downtown Dallas. On Sunday, November 24th, 1963, while he was in the process of being transferred to a new location, a man named Jack Ruby shot and killed Oswald. There are almost as many conspiracy theories about the murder of Oswald as there are about the assassination of JFK. Basically, the gist of these theories is that Ruby was acting as an agent of powerful interests when he shot Oswald. That Ruby, in essence, killed Oswald in order to ensure Oswald would not talk and spilled the beans about whoever was behind the alleged conspiracy to kill the president. We are not going to go into these theories today, but we will quickly share what we believe what may be the biggest single argument against the idea of a Ruby conspiracy. And that argument is personified by Postal Inspector Harry Holmes. Let us explain. We need to look at the timeline of Ruby's movements on the morning of the 24th. Ruby, you may recall, ran a nightclub in Dallas, and he actually closed it down on the weekend of the assassination out of respect for the president. This meant that his employees did not get paid that weekend. On Sunday morning, Ruby got a call from an exotic dancer who worked for him. She was in an emergency and needed some money. He agreed to send some to her via Western Union. He then drove downtown and went to the Western Union office. The money order he sent to his employee was time-stamped at 11.17 a.m. As he left the Western Union office, Ruby strolled over a half block to police headquarters where he saw there was something clearly going on. He made his way down to the police garage in time to see Oswald being led out to an armored car. At that point, he pulled out his gun and shot Oswald, killing him. It was 11.21 a.m. The murder of Oswald was therefore a split-second affair. If Ruby had been delayed a minute here or a minute there, he would not have been on the scene in the moment he would have had the opportunity to pull the trigger. By the same token, if the police had taken Oswald out a little earlier or a little later, then Ruby also would have missed his chance. The whole thing depends on Ruby being at exactly the right place at exactly the right time. If you want to take the conspiratorial view, you would argue that this was no mere chance that police knew the exact moment they would take Oswald out and relayed that information to Ruby so that he could perfectly time his trip to the Western Union. And this is where Postal Inspector Harry Holmes comes in. He'd taken a part in the investigation earlier, helping to nail down some of the details surrounding Oswald renting the postal box where he received the rifle. He was driving to church with his wife on Sunday morning, More or less on a whim, he decided that he would instead stop by police headquarters to see if he could be of any help. He dropped his wife off at church and set off. The investigators not only let him sit in on a Sunday morning interrogation of Oswald, but also gave Holmes the opportunity to ask his own questions. Holmes made the most of it, and it is estimated that his questioning made the interrogation run a half hour longer than it would have lasted had Holmes not shown up. Take a moment to appreciate what that means. If Holmes would have gone to church that morning, Oswald's interrogation would have ended a half hour earlier, and he would have been transferred a half hour sooner. He likely would have been inside that armored car and outside of the police garage 
before Ruby even walked into that Western Union office. And no conspirators could have known in advance that Holmes would skip church and head to police headquarters. It was a choice he made more or less on the spur of the moment. So his arrival and the subsequent longer interrogation could not have been part of any intricate timetable worked out in advance with Jack Ruby. To us, the story of Harry Holmes strongly suggests that the shooting of Oswald by Ruby happened by mere chance and was not a part of a conspiracy. We will talk quite a bit more about the assassination and some of the arguments for conspiracy in our next episode on this case, which we are hoping to get released sometime in the latter part of next week. In that episode, we will also answer some of your questions about the JFK case, and we will also hear directly from a member of our audience who has a personal connection to this case and was able to provide some information that helped to debunk one of the more popular conspiracy theories out there. And if you have further questions that you want us to address, please drop them in our Google form, which we will include in our show notes. Thank you. In our show notes in the next episode, we will also be providing a full list of excellent sources on the Kennedy assassination. Thanks so much for listening to The Murder Sheet. If you have a tip concerning one of the cases we cover, please email us at murdersheet at gmail.com. If you have actionable information about an unsolved crime, please report it to the appropriate authorities. If you're interested in joining our Patreon, that's available at www.patreon.com slash murdersheet. If you want to tip us a bit of money for records requests, you can do so at www.buymeacoffee.com slash murdersheet. We very much appreciate any support. Special thanks to Kevin Tyler Greenley, who composed the music for the murder sheet, and who you can find on the web at kevintg.com. If you're looking to talk with other listeners about a case we've covered, you can join the Murder Sheet discussion group on Facebook. We mostly focus our time on research and reporting, so we're not on social media much. We do try to check our email account, but we ask for patience as we often receive a lot of messages. Thanks again for listening.